parte dello sviluppo della motorizzazione agricola e industriale, motori diesel lombardini, motori a scacchio intermoto. This is the legendary Dino Ferrari circuit at Imola, Italy. It's April 1986. Imola is the shrine for these fans who are known as the Tifosi. Roughly translated, Tifosi means touched by the wind. But the Tifosi are stirred by power. They are not followers of drivers. Instead, they worship this car, the Ferrari 186. The Tifosi know every detail of its brutally powerful engine of its scarlet carbon fiber fuselage. And most of all, they love its spectacular twitchy chassis. Formula One is the stuff of Italian enthusiasm. The Tifosi are literally high on technology, especially when Ferrari wins. Behind the razzmatazz of Formula One is a rarely seen world of skill and inventiveness. Gone are the oily rags and the flat-capped amateurs. Here, computers, rubber, metallurgy, synthetics, electronics and aerodynamics consume fortunes. This team alone confesses to spending seven and a half million pounds a year, but probably consumes about twice that. Formula One is a technological dynasty, a dueling ground for the big multinationals. But for today's Formula One engineers, the big question is how to tame the fiery, unpredictable turbo. Brands Hatch two years earlier. This is the 1984 British Grand Prix. It was during this season that the high technology world of Formula One engineering first started to establish a method for taming the turbo. Apart from this normally aspirated 3-litre Ford Cosworth-powered Tyrrell, all the cars are 1.5-litre and, and turbocharged. Hidden beneath the international sponsors lurk the even bigger automotive manufacturers. This Parmalat Brabham is not powered by Italian cheese, but German BMW. And its turbo engine is now mated to this, a Bosch onboard computer. It is literally the engine's brain. In 1984, these electronic black boxes are still relatively primitive. Because for the computer programmers, Formula One engine management is a completely new problem. This is engine designer Keith Duckworth. Duckworth is the fallen prince of Formula One. His motor racing masterpiece was the now outdated, unturbocharged Ford DFB. Duckworth is at the British Grand Prix as a mere observer to watch BMW, Honda, Porsche and Renault rise to take his crown as the most successful Formula One engine designer ever. Of particular interest is the fast developing Japanese Honda engine in this Williams car. Even Lotus have newfound power with their French Renault turbo engine, controlled by its Bendix computer. But the man with Duckworth is Mike Cranifus, an affable German-American and head of Ford Motorsport. He shares wisecracks with Duckworth about the influence his designs have had on this new generation of engines. You can say that after a couple of four years of seriously thinking they have come to the same conclusion you came, or you had arrived at it 67. <laughs> Although the enthusiastic crowd sunburning in the warm English summer couldn't have known it at the time, 
It's at this race that Ford and Duckworth finally agree to build a new engine. We ought to start the game. We ought to start the game one. But there are many who say that Duckworth's distaste for turbocharging will prevent him ever designing another successful engine. It's a view until recently shared by many within Ford itself. Vice Chairman, Ford of Europe, Walter Hayes. I didn't really like turbos. I, I always felt our engine was an old master and turbos were modern art, you know? And I, I don't want to sound like a fuddy-duddy, but I think it's a very fair description of where I felt the difference was. When our traditional teams started to be beaten by the Renaults, and what I still think was a distortion of the regulations, I'm not complaining, I don't believe that one and a half litres turbocharged is equivalent to three litres unturbocharged. But the rule said that turbocharging was legal, and it was another major manufacturer, Renault, who realised its potential. <laughs> At the 1977 British Grand Prix, this small black and yellow car qualified for the first time. The engine was based on a normal road car and simply turbocharged for racing. No one took it seriously, except of course the unconventional French engineers at Renault. Probably because motorsport's governing body is also French, the turbo was allowed to survive. This is a road car turbocharger, but the principle is the same when applied to a race engine. The power of any engine is limited by the amount of air it can breathe in. A turbocharger uses energy from the hot exhaust gas, which is otherwise wasted, to power a compressor. This simply pumps compressed air into the engine, producing more power. The turbo itself consists of a gas turbine connected directly to a compressor by this shaft. The exhaust gas spins the turbine and forces the compressor to pump more air. The more air, the more exhaust gas, and the more exhaust, the more air. Theoretically, a runaway spiral of explosive power. Keith Duckworth. I think that in any racing engine, the nearer you are to it disintegrating, in general, the better its performance will be. To combat this excessive turbo power from such small engines, ever-decreasing fuel limitations have been imposed on the teams. So it's for fuel economy that engine management electronics have become crucial. As soon as you get on to economy, you can't afford to uh, throw fuel in for cooling. Therefore, you have to try and put in exactly the right amount of fuel. Then, if you have any failure or on your um, engine management system to provide that right amount of fuel, and it goes uh, marginally weak from the weak position that you're already trying to run for economy, uh, you can melt your turbine in a second or melt a valve or a piston and you're out of the race. As can be seen fairly regularly. Turbocharged racing engines can be developed in two ways. Start from scratch, or like Renault, take a ready-made engine block and alter it until it delivers the necessary output. Anything from 700 to 1,000 brake horsepower. Whether developed from an off-the-shelf design or built from scratch, there are two basic engine configurations. The V6 engine and the inline or straight four. The numbers refer to the number of cylinders or pistons. And the word straight or V refers to the arrangement of the cylinders or the pistons in relation to the crankshaft. This is an end view of a straight four. The Italian Ferrari, the French Renault, the German Porsche, the Italian Moto Moderni, and the Japanese Honda are all V6s with overlapping throws onto the crankshaft. 
This is the end view of the Honda V6. The German BMW and the British Hart engines are straight four units. BMW have been particularly successful with this neat, if rather asymmetric, engine layout. But the engine is only part of the story. Tucked into the car are the radiators for cooling the engine, intercoolers for the turbochargers, pipes, oil coolers, exhaust, and the red-hot turbochargers themselves. So it's the reduction in the size and complexity of all this, as well as the reduction in the size of the engine block, that is the main engineering challenge. Compactness and the fact that four-cylinder engines tend to be more economical than sixes finally led Duckworth to develop this aging four-cylinder sports car engine. It's autumn, 1984. Mike Cranifers and Walter Hayes have set November 1985 as the deadline for the delivery of a race-ready engine. By February, the four-cylinder prototype is on the dynamometer. engine is conventional. Two pulleys at the top drive double overhead camshafts. The rest is just cobbled together for testing. The throttle linkage is operated from within the soundproof control room. Perhaps the only odd feature is the enormous silver plenum chamber alongside the engine. This plenum is where the boosted air is balanced before entering the engine. By making it big, Duckworth hopes to tune the air to match the outgoing exhaust pulses. For early testing, the exhaust is vented without passing it through a turbine. Boost air pressure is delivered to the engine from this yellow industrial compressor connected to the test cell via a network of heavy-duty pipes. This method of boosting the engine removes the complexity of developing a turbocharger while allowing the designers to vary the air pressure. But as Duckworth admits, sooner or later this clumsy plumbing must be miniaturized and installed in a racing car. Today, the compressed air is two bar, about 28 pounds per square inch, the pressure of an ordinary car tire. Using strategically placed sensors, the tedious business of engine mapping begins. The hand on the throttle belongs to chief test engineer, Alan Morris. 25.45, 3.8, 3.9, 7, 17, 4.92. 15 moves. Oh, 10,000. That's revolutions per minute. Mapping, as the word suggests, is the business of recording coordinates, all the data, input and output, at all engine speeds and loads. 4.5, right. 25.15. That's engine load. 4.3. That's blow-by, air escaping past the piston. 9. Exhaust pressure. 21. Intake temperature. 4.92. 4.92 are the milliseconds the fuel droplets take to spread into the cylinder before igniting. Right, 10,500 coming up. In its original unboosted okay. form, this modest four-cylinder engine was limited to speeds of 10,500 revolutions a minute. 
beyond this is unknown territory. Right, okay, 4.5. 23.05, 4.5, 95 11,000 4.5 22.65 4.4 90 95 We've had a um, accident Did the blow by go? No, it's not blow. A fibre optic endoscope probes the cylinders as Alan Morris measures the pulleys on the yeah. silent engine. Yeah, you get the centre there, look. That. The difference between there and there, look. Well, just turn the engine around. Oh, we can't. That's the problem. It's a little bit tight. Oh. The cam drive belt has jumped oh, one notch out of alignment. It's the first outward sign of a catastrophic failure, yeah. now confirmed yeah. by the probing of Paul Ray. I think the piston's hard up against the barrel, so... Yeah. But it looks like the inlet and the exhaust are crossing, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, but... No, it's definitely not interesting. Go on, Alan. Yeah. Oh, OK. We take it off. Right. Two hours later, the engine is in the workshop. Off comes the cam cover. For Paul Skelton, this is the start of the routine, absolutely methodical process of damage analysis. A mechanical post-mortem. To avoid distortion, even on a damaged engine, the bolts must be released in a set order. As the cylinder head and plenum chamber come off, the damaged piston is revealed. The earlier analysis by endoscope was correct. The valves have hit the piston. But so far, there are no clues why. The exhaust and inlet valves have definitely hit the piston or crossed over. But this can be caused by many things at high engine speeds. General Manager of Engineering Dick Scammell is uncharacteristically nervous about such a dramatic failure so soon. Because the piston's been hitting the head, hasn't it? I mean, it's been thumping on the head uh, quite a long time, but it's formed the piston into the combustion chamber. Scammell knows BMW have achieved remarkable reliability and power with their four-cylinder engine. The next clue is in the oil. Tiny metal fragments clatter into the drip tray. The post-mortem continues on the gutted engine. Sinister dents in the temporary steel sump seem to suggest some kind of internal explosion.
an overwhelming atmosphere of depression creeps in. To Chief Development Engineer Martin Walters, it looks bad. Even now, the crankshaft refuses to turn as quite large chunks of big end bearing begin to turn out. What they don't know at this stage is that the entire engine block has changed shape, seizing the internal components. I am puzzled why we can't turn the engine. The scattered and broken pieces begin to come together to form a picture of a much larger disease. This little cup of scrap metal is all that remains of the big end bearing, symptoms of an endemic weakness in the engine design. The problem is there isn't as much heat as I think you normally see when you just lose a bearing. It's only come up about this far now. Normally, it tends to get a bit hotter. That may be that a bolt broke first. Excessive heat due to lubrication failure makes steel turn blue. Just hammer this way out through the end. With no obvious discoloration, the search for the cause moves away from lubrication failure to metal fatigue. That's, yes, that's been stretched. Stretch, 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 stretch. But what started the failure? The bearing going, but why the bearing? Why the bearing? There's not enough heat in that bearing, is there? The first lesson that the Cosworth engineers are learning is that even a familiar engine, when it's turbocharged, can fail in mysterious and catastrophic ways. News of the explosion has reached Jeff Goddard, chief racing engine designer. What do you think went first? I don't know because. It's something odd because you can't stand the crack. Goddard, an expert on metal fatigue, has never been happy with the plan to turbocharge this old four-cylinder engine block. As the pistons are forced out one by one, it becomes clear that a massive explosion has occurred. What's worse is that it all happened well below race boost pressures. The omens are not good. Five more four-cylinder engines fail in the next three weeks. Eventually, the cause is traced to incurable vibration at the crankshaft. They 
are little over a year away from the first scheduled in-car test and back where they started without an engine. Yes, it's still oh, the same. Man, through there yes. and up here, isn't it? It's just got less on the shaft rotating with you. Piston ring seals, we are on piston rings. The torch dangers, yeah. they haven't got anything. They haven't, that, that seal doesn't work. 100 PSI, forget it. 15 is max. Towards the end of 1984, the atmosphere of gloom over the failure of the four-cylinder engine is replaced by optimism. Funding for the design of a completely new engine has been agreed. It will be a Ferrari-like V6. Keith Duckworth. The choice of a, want a V6 is on the basis that most people are using V6s who are successful and that therefore, whichever way the rules go, we feel that they will be to suit V6s. The 120 degree V6 does allow you to fit two standard turbochargers in the conventional position, one on each side of the engine, and therefore you can in fact join the rest of them in the now established situation. And then Duckworth has always believed that turbo energy is wasted merely pumping air. Eventually, he intends to take a drive off one large centrally mounted turbo and feed it back into the engine. It's the revival of a pre-war idea known as compounding. Then proceed with the compounded setup. The additional point is that as we have not got a team uh, sorted out uh, with whose engineers we can discuss the layout of the car and the amount of intercooling that you need for the compounded layout and the weight and the whole complexity of it means that uh, an awful lot of discussion with a team would have to take place whereas if we in practice make a standardish looking V6 with the twin turbo layouts then we know enough about car design and the intercooling requirements and it's sufficiently near the normal swing of things that we should have a, a very good chance even if a team isn't selected till late on. The choice of which team will have the new engine is a problem for Ford to solve. For now, Duckworth's designs are in the hands of men whose craft would have been recognized by the great engineers Brunel, Telford and Stevenson. This is the Zeus Pattern and Tool Company in Birmingham. Here, flat blueprints are turned by skillful carving into three-dimensional wooden formers from which molds can be made. Seasoned Brazilian mahogany is chiseled, honed and polished until the grain is as smooth as steel. This is the crankcase end. And this will be the pattern for the main engine block. Several hundred Formula One engines do not warrant an investment in computer-aided design. All that's needed is a calculator, a notebook, and two centuries of engineering know-how. We should have gone behind the fence. Sir Josh from Zara in this. Well, that's the word blind, man. I tell you, we were already from the fifth one. So how many are going to pinch? If I pinch another for you, we should have 20, because that's... Even at this stage, flexibility is crucial. Long and painstaking discussions tease out the best way to solve minor design difficulties. Ryan's already marked, already put that right in the drawing. Yes, yeah, it's a good job I noticed that. 
the shape of the two degrees out from the That's right. We've got it on this side. Uh, we've got loose pieces on this side. Just like, one loose piece on the. T oh, but that I don't get none of that either. That's right. only past, that's past the flanger. That's right. Within hours of the pattern being finished, the first cylinder head has been cast in its silicate sand mould at a foundry in Worcester. The valuable sand is broken away and recycled to be packed again and again around the mahogany former. For Formula One, this rough lump of cast aluminium marks a rare event the birth of a completely new engine. This casting will never be used. Instead, it will be sliced and analyzed to check its strength. Chicago-based Beatrice is a huge American trading company. In February, 1985, at the highest level, Ford and Beatrice do a deal. The result is an aerospace quality engineering company on a windy industrial estate near Heathrow. Yeah, the engine's going to tie up with that very nicely. Yes, the electronics will be the last sort of thing in the file. Yeah. When will we get an actual like... engine as a lump of we, the metal part? It will build a racing car exclusively for the new engine. The, other car... the first driver is to be ex-world champion Long Alan Jones. Yeah. This is it's too much of an angle that way. Yeah. And it's too much of a load on your wrist. Yeah, if, you... if you're turning, if it's on an angle that way, up. well then the wrist yeah. has to go like that and it's putting, putting a strain on it. Whereas if the wheel is more it's up, down, and down, up and down, and then it's so just a straight movement with your elbow. Otherwise, elbows. if you're really up there, you're riding, riding like a London bus. Absolutely, yes. and you're putting, you you're putting right unnecessary over. work on your wrists. Yeah. Whereas if it's more upright, you do it with your arms. So that's John Baldwin is the like chief that. designer. And you haven't got any problems with that on the news. No, that's okay now. Because that is higher than the other car. Yeah, no, that's fine. Uh, so and if I was to go back further, it would make that even better. Yeah, because we've now got the shape of your back yeah. anyway. So um, what we can do is actually design your seat, the start of your seat, instead of doing it the old way. So I can block, block up. So we can put this shape into the car yeah and then start to foam and make the seat to fit you and you've broken it's it detachable <laughs> steering wheel <laughs> <laughs> another one i've broken <laughs> Within weeks, the first aluminium castings are ready for machining. This 120 degree V6 block is turned upside down so that the crankshaft can be eased in. If you're not careful with it, it's going to hit the side of the block and could cause, you know, quite a bit of damage to it. So you have to be very careful whilst you're dropping it in. Because of Duckworth's obsession with structural strength, the engine is not easy to put together. And there are many tricks to learn. And they've got locating pins at the bottom as well. You've got to try to feel your way until they fit. After every race, each engine will have to be rebuilt. A year from now, Alan Eldridge will probably be able to do this blindfold. I think that's about it.
Now, special blocks are temporarily fitted to the crankcase studs. The studs take short bars, which can be expanded with a spanner. This spreads the engine block by a few millimeters to allow the bearing cap to slip down and bear on the crankshaft. These bearings do two jobs. They hold the crankshaft, spinning up to 12,000 revolutions a minute, and they act as strong bridges or buttresses joining both sides of the engine block. Before the expandable bars are removed, the bearing caps are bolted down. The process of spreading the block is repeated for all four bearing caps. Now the pistons. Three in each bank of cylinders. A special cup helps Eldridge slip them into the bores. These pistons are made in Germany, but once the engine is proved, Cosworth will manufacture their own. The pistons are very special. Hollow galleries in the top, or the crown, circulate high-pressure oil. The oil will be injected as the piston descends in the ball. In effect, the pistons are oil-cooled. But this first drop of oil is just to help put the engine together. The crankshaft is turned. This is one of six big end bearings. These are the bolts that failed on the old four cylinder engine when the bearing seized. They will have to cope with hundreds of tons during a Grand Prix. These seals sit on the cylinder bores. In this engine, the bores, like gun barrels, are separate tubes known as liners. For simplicity, oil for the separate cylinder head is forced through external steel tubes.
cylinder head bolts are angled. A typical Cosworth answer to a tricky problem. The original reason why we angled our head bolts was to allow you to uh, have them go coming through the head and yet missing the cam shafts because the most convenient position is in the same line and that is what caused a lot of engines to have to be separated with the head bolts below and a separate cam carrier. Allied to that one, we then were looking at liner situations and the best way of making a head joint and liner. And I de devised a scheme of a, a liner which the head was nominally clamped on top of the liners and the liner split was fairly low down. But then the stiffness of the top of the liner and its support was not adequate. And therefore, the angle bolt puts in a component squeezing the two sides of the block together and therefore will tie and increase the stiffness at the top of the bore where the gas pressure is the highest. Weighing about 100 kilograms, the first engine is complete. But another potentially more powerful engine is still proving difficult to finish. American Frank Rayo from Motorola and British electronics engineer Steve Taylor are still hunting the bugs from the prototype engine management computer. This is called Eliminate all the noise you possibly can, so the engine runs. <laughs> engine runs, full stop. And when it gets back... It's... Hang on, Frank, you got a short back. See, it shorts out, huh? Yep. That's the one. It's on so one of that line there? there. One of those is not the right one. Gone, right. Yeah, we've done so much to the, uh, the circuitry and software. Yeah, but I just want to prove it, all right? I want to put it back to its original mountain. Okay, check the grounds now. It's four in the morning. They've been working for 18 hours, only to discover what many other Formula One engineers already know, that electromagnetic pulses from the engine play havoc with the delicate memory circuits in the microprocessor. These are all tied to ground now. Got a five? Yeah. Ten. Okay. See this piece of solder on here. This painstaking detective work is the only way to hunt down rogue signals. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, seventeen, twenty, twenty-four, twenty-five, seven, twenty-eight. You've done twenty-seven. Yeah, well, 27 here should be VSS minus. 27, 28. You've done that. Okay. How about this one? Yeah, well, that's the one you said we were shorting out on. Here, let's verify that. It could be 29. Ah. It should be open. Hold your meter on that. I could find out which one it is. It's amazing how. Yeah, there it is right there. 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. Oh, 30 is a ground. Oh, why is it pulling supply there? Uh, it was open. You tied a B band to it yeah. on one case. Good. Okay, so that's all set. We have a big ground path. All those pens are just set of a ground, right? Yes. No, no, it's ignition diagnostics. IDM, we're not yeah, using it. Right. Okay, so uh, when you're an engine purr, we appreciate all these kludges. Mm -hmm. 
make sure that we haven't grounded anything on the way. We're looking good, from it. Good. The final test is running this piece of wire to case ground. Is that the last one? Yeah. Fantastic. That looks like you're buying the bears to ride in. Okay, no problem. Known as a tub, because the driver sits in it as if in a bar, this main part of the racing car is a composite made from carbon fibre. Formula One engineers are world leaders in the use of this strong, ultralight aerospace technology. The two halves of the tub are bonded together. This steel jig will hold the two halves in place until the bond has set. Perhaps the first driver owing his life to carbon fibre was Britain's John Watson. After this 150 mile an hour crash at the 1981 Italian Grand Prix, he climbed from his McLaren's composite tub without a scratch. Peter Turland built that tub for Watson. The bond takes about three quarters of an hour to go off. This tub it is for Jones. Tucky, you can't, um, but the engine is still so secret, even he isn't sure of the specification. There's an engine plate on the top, which lays along at the angle of the engine, which is probably 45 degrees, or I think it's 45 degrees on this one. I'm not quite sure, actually. And then it's hooked to those two points there, like that one and that one. <laughs> the V6 turbo is on the dynamometer in Northampton. Frank Rayo arrives with his engine management black box. You want boost also? Yes. 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 What is reference? Steve Taylor and Ford software expert Jim Coates from the States set up the monitors. Okay, it's that one. That's our spout line. That's on the current probe as well. Right. Good. Steve, yeah. is this timeline still flashing? Uh, initially, yes, please, just to verify. Set these up when you put an injection up at the top here. Yeah, start start with injection from the top. Pair of headphones. Yeah. Okay. On the dyno, this is this is the most likely place for that to happen too. Mm -hmm. From Ford Electronic Engine Development in the States, Bob Stelmazak has watched over the program for a year. Now the final minutes tick by. Yeah. All right, that's it. We're ready. Can you? Oh, certainly. I'd be more than happy to. Because the engine map is incomplete, these two manual controls will override the computer. The left-hand dial controls spark advance. The right controls the fuel injector pulse width. Exactly 20 years ago, Duckworth's legendary DFV engine was fired up on this same dynamometer. The new turbo seems reluctant to follow. Go. Reset. Just see if she's yeah, let's come see if we can clean point. it out before we hit it. For a moment, there's confusion. Stelmazak asks whether he should expand or reduce the fuel pulse. Okay, 
we should find out what the pulse width is in this state it's running in to find out if we're you know, I mean I I gotta find out what pulse width we're at to know how what the mix ought to be. Yeah. I can't see it from here. Can you guys get any idea? What division you're at? Let's say about one division, whatever that is. One millisecond. Are we tricking anything out there, like engine cooling or anything that can, that's not picking up an appropriate signal? No, we shouldn't. For Stelmazak, this first encounter with the frustration of Formula One technology is infuriating. Back in the States, his boss, Mike Cranifus, will want good news. Right now, there isn't any. No, we have to find out what we're doing. This isn't going well. British Grand Prix of 1984, the decision to build a one and a half litre turbocharged Formula One engine was agreed between Ford and the specialist engineering company Cosworth. Keith Duckworth, designer of the successful old Cosworth DFV, soon faced a desperately compressed schedule after his first attempt with this four cylinder engine failed. From now on, everything would hinge on this the sophisticated engine management computer. Last week's program ended as the technicians struggled to start the new six-cylinder engine, their first faltering step on the long road to perfect a fully competitive turbo. That's pretty rich. I see it's a sustained current injector. Yeah, here it comes. The engine is running, just. A faltering misfire at 4,000 revolutions a minute means something is wrong. They're taking 12 volt factory to zero momentarily. The whole factory. Inside the test cell with the engine, Paul Ray and electronics expert Steve Taylor watch the fuel pulse signal jam open as the engine's ignition flattens the battery. It seems as though it's pulling the battery right down. Yeah, because the contacts are going open up there. If you wire it direct, you won't have the same thing as the battery. Like a season of jumping out? It's still missing a few. Yeah, I can yeah, feel it from just sitting here yeah. feeling the ground. Yeah. Okay, you know what we forgot to do? It might be... There we go. Okay, now that it's dead. Steve. Was it? The engine is shut off. It's time to make some changes. Yeah, I can tell that. It's fuel. I can feel it. Put the suppressor line in. I think we'll be okay. A spark scatter, and the odd spark is missing, but but that could just be the engine running so rough yeah, that we're right. actually oh, yeah. Yeah. Tor torque jitter back. And forth. For Taylor, there's simply relief that his rewiring of the engine management computer actually it works. Because it means that the um, that ignition modification to the spark output has cleaned up the bank feeding noise to, to spark. Mm -hmm. That was stable on there. I could watch it tomorrow. Well, I say stable, it was continuous. Yeah. Hey, Steve, uh, the spark drops off and the fuel keeps going? No, no. It's plenty of spark. It's, it's fuel. The spark stays on. It's fuel. Oh, the spark stays on. The fuel shuts off. We're not into a fuel loop at all, are we, Jim? No, Haven't got no, uh, no. nothing to affect fueling at all. No. OK. You got the lead. Um, he did make a calibration change so that everything in this looks at the left side. By left side and right side, they mean the left or the right bank of cylinders in the V6 engine. 
And it is. It's behaving pretty much the yeah. way you'd expect it to. We've got good right to left. We're missing the same number of times on the right as we are on the left, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And the temperatures are even. The temperatures are yeah. very nice. Yeah. Yeah, very oh, good. good. So, well, I think we're close. You know, I think if we back the step one more time, we're going to yeah. be just about where we want yeah, to start our today. 40 minutes later. That feels a lot better. Yeah. Just the engine is running at 7,000 revolutions a minute. To make it run more economically, they must now reduce the fuel pulse width. Engine noise and soundproofing reduce instructions to a series of hand signals. Good. It's very good. Yeah. Looks, you can feel it. You know, everything yeah. is... Formula One is really a fuel formula. Each year, the cars must become more economical as the permitted fuel load is reduced. The trick will be to make the engine the most powerful and yet the most economical ever designed. Steve, It's quivering. Yeah, we're getting a little bit of false trigger. Coming Okay, I see what's happening there. We're going to change. So that's the true trigger. That's right. What we're doing is we're falling in and out of phase, but not by very many crank degrees. No, so you can't no. really feel it out here. But if we had the stacks open, you could see some fluff coming out. Let's see where we're at. A little bit more. Fluff is smoke caused by too much fuel. The computer is still picking up rogue signals triggering the fuel injector at the wrong moment. Taylor searches in vain for the rogue signal. We just had a little one come through. I don't know if you felt it. There it goes yeah. again. We're falling. I bet you, well, we're getting one big one come through, and we're coming out of sync for two revs, yeah. and then we go back into sync. That's why we feel that. Okay, it's time almost to put on the new cam sensor then. Gee, we get to try everything today. Tag it up if yes, that's happy. As soon as I see somebody look at me, I'll tell them. The engine is okay. shut down. What are you to? Seven. Seven. We had good temperature. We had an occasional miss, one of them which took out the whole system and brought it down to cold. And then we recovered and brought back the yeah, whole I mean system. The, the yeah, fuel. Fuel. Our safety, our safety barrier on field was working well. When it sees the problem, it's shutting fuel off so we don't overrun, which is pretty good. But it's fuel economy conscious, all right? <laughs> but at the wrong time, yeah, I'm right sure there. Alan Jones will appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think it's time to change the cam sensor uh, finger so we can maybe get a little of that noise out of it, if there is any there? Noise is jargon for the unwanted electromagnetic pulses. Yeah, we're still seeing noise, and we're, we're, the, the strategy is obviously going into some high region, and the fuel shut off. You can put in for protection. Is yeah, uh, it's catching that. Uh, it's actually catching it. it. Really is shutting it off like yeah. it's supposed to. So the strategy is working okay. We just uh, <laughs> the, the good news problem. is the engine runs, but the bad news is not all the time. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's steady on. You're the only looking at one injector, right? An hour later, the reason for the erratic fuel injector pulse is still a mystery. If we could look at all six, and you said that, I I would walk away from it. Point taken. Yeah, you it know, could be happening in one of the events. We always talked about doing that. We said, what if we didn't have a nice quiet spot to sample plenum pressure? What would yeah. be the result? And the answer was, the computer would Bounce come around. through, it would pick off a high spot on the wave, run a calculation and send out, then it would come into the valley, pick another one and send out another totally different pulse and continue to iterate that way. It can do that. Perhaps not surprisingly, they find that all the wires are acting like radio aerials, picking up pulses from the engine's ignition system. That's the identification link. It's nothing. But it doesn't go anywhere. It's not connected to anything. It's just an open wire. Yeah, follow the tab there. After two hours of rewiring, the V6, triggered by its computer, sounds like a racer for the first time.
the fuel pulse is steady at last. Fuel mixture is made fractionally leaner, and they decide to take the engine up to 10,000 revolutions a minute. For good measure, Steve Taylor moves the sensor to another fuel injector to check all six are receiving clean signals from the computer. Steve Taylor gets the signal. 10,000 revolutions. They have an engine that runs. Perhaps this, at last, is the end of the beginning. Yeah. I like that. Ten days later, software expert Jim Coates has returned to the States. OK, let's ask Jim if uh, he's uh, received my changes. Steve Taylor and Bob Stelmazak in Northampton communicate with him daily by computer. No, Jim's still not awake yet. OK. Do you want to read one of your mail messages? I certainly would. I'd like to read all of them, and I'm going to get a hard copy of them if I can. The engine management computer, or module, was designed to be strapped on top of the engine. But because of the rogue signals, they've decided to redesign it for another position on the car. The modules are being uh, fabricated in the States and sent back over here once they're checked. And, ah. Uh, right. In fact, Jim Coates, who's now responding, he's phoning us on the VAX, has sent us a message here at 2.54 in the morning, and if we got him up at 5.30, he didn't have much okay. sleep last night again. Now, well, Jim is, is phoning us, and we're going to try to answer him if we can. Right, time's 6.22 over in the States at the moment. Jim's just getting up, had breakfast, <laughs> fed the kids, and uh, is, in, is getting into work. I don't think he's been to bed personally. He better not have. I'd be disappointed otherwise. It depends on his typing speed. If it's slow, we'll know he's been working all night. He's pretty slow. <laughs> <laughs> we might have got him before coffee. See if he understood why we made the changes. Um... And, and, and ask him when he reviews them to evaluate the effect on speed, the printing speed of the display. OK, he's going to look at them this morning. With a six-hour time difference, work on problems can continue long after the British engineers have finished Very for the nice. day. Yes, OK, good. Even so, there's always an element of competition between the two groups. I wonder if you thought of that initially. I don't think so. Because the engine management computer is to be moved, a complete wiring change will be necessary. I've just told him the status here now is that Cosworth have issued a wiring change that will be carried out with the hardware, and this will be carried through while this particular requirement for module reverse mountings is maintained. Um, as long as he knows the status that we're at in the UK, then his bench setup will mirror the image of the dynamometer and fixings here. Hopefully, so that if we get any problems, he should see them in the US. Doesn't always work, mind you, but <laughs> we try and get as close to the real thing as we can. We have to keep both sides of the water informed so that if he's making any changes on his benches or if he gets a particular problem, he has to be to the same standard we're at in, in the UK um, otherwise, we're both chasing different problems, and he may be chasing a problem that's a day old and we've already resolved. The program for the engine management microprocessor is top secret. 
It must read, evaluate, and act upon constantly varying information several hundred times between each stroke of each of the six pistons. But as the project to develop an advanced engine management program reaches its climax, the danger of this transatlantic data being hijacked grows. It may be of interest to someone who would be developing electronics for Formula One engines. There's only a few of us, you know. Um, as far as the ability to break into it, uh, if a user who is not authorized to get on the system attempts to break into the computer, and if he knows part of the information he needs, and he attempts to just try it over and over until he comes up with the proper combination, the computer will recognize his attempt to break in, and in the software, in the computer, it's instructed to take evasive action so that even if he does find the correct combination, it will not let him in until a certain time has passed where the computer has judged he has probably gone away and the true user can come back in. So I think the access privileges are quite secure. February the 21st, 1986. It's 9.15 in the morning and six degrees below freezing at the Boreham Proving Ground in Essex. The car was completed the night before and both drivers are here. Patrick Tombo. Duckworth congratulates Jeff Goddard. Wiring changes are still incomplete, so the finned aluminium computer remains on top of the engine. Obscured by the complex turbo machinery, the size of the small engine seems to surprise even Duckworth. It just sits in the shadow, the, 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 the small engine sits in the shadow of the car. Um, but uh, I don't the intercoolers and everything else don't look quite so uh, big and out and in the way, do they? Somehow. I suppose it's looking down on it is better than looking at the thing and all that. But the turbos and the radiators, known as plumbing, have been the responsibility of the car's designers. Oh, all the plumbing uh, look, looks, yeah, looks, bad, looks very nice, way, doesn't, doesn't it, actually, with that? And the, from having put the centre intake in here, getting that into there, and just about sneaking this thing round the corner. No, I, I noticed that the depth of the, it's the it's wrong way around, isn't it? Right. It, should, it should be deep and thin in that direction instead of being wide and far. Yeah. Yes. Are, are we allowed <laughs> them that one? Because I did the pressure <laughs> drops and it was or okay. Or it's the body like that. If we go the other way, it doesn't fit the body. Oh. Hey, I didn't realise those things are going to be sticking out there like... Alan Jones will be the first to drive a car so new that even the team are unfamiliar with the controls. Hey, Kiwi. Yes. Which way's on on the steering wheel? It's smart. Oh, it's sort of right. There are five straps on the safety harness, two over the shoulder, two on the hips, and one round the crutch. It must be fitted by the engineer, but can be released with one punch on a center catch to escape in case of fire. Like his overalls, the balaclava is fireproof for a few valuable seconds and could save his life. 
Um, and the oil price is meant to be about 60, somewhere in that cord, all right? Okay. Right. And what's it, uh, running temperature, if it's below a certain thing? Uh, I really want to be above 80. Yeah, so it, it doesn't have to come in a bit yeah, more tape on it. On goes the carbon fiber body shell. Two years of work and millions of dollars are now in the hands of one man. The road to world left off, but even later on, you need to be above 80 before we give it any stick. Yeah. I just uh, uh, stick and sit about above 80 and uh, oil pressure 60. Unlike Jones, Patrick Tombe has driven for Ferrari and has learned to judge a turbo by its sound. Sounds good. For a few moments, everyone forgets the cold. It's real Formula One at last. Don't turn it off from there. It's running about uh, 78 or so. That's oil That's pressure. About 85. Even with the radiators blanked off, the engine has only just reached its operating temperature in the icy conditions. <laughs> Steering wheel position is good. Pedal position is good, except for the accelerator and brake. And I've got the gear stick a bit further away, as much as you could. Um, but this feels a lot better. You know, more support. Yeah. <coughs> Engine run cleanly? Yeah, no yeah, very clean. Clean as a whistle. There's no, there's no sort of popping and banging, it's just... No, it's really as ex-Williams designer Neil Oatley keeps a careful note, Tombe asks if there's any lag in the throttle response. Yeah, it feels very good, you know? Very good response. No, no popping or banging or... Synchronized with one another. The engine. Synchronization, synchronization between the, the throttle and the engine. So far, you know, I'm not going all that quick, but it feels good. <coughs> the engine management module is only slightly warmer than Jones. Dick, you haven't made any provisions for a heater, have you? <laughs> not quite yet, no. God, I think it's cold in there, isn't it? Oh, <laughs> ah. <laughs> Except for me. Yeah. Ah, See, that's what it might have been for the engine. <laughs> Despite Jones's good humour, this old airfield is icy and dangerous. By 10.30, conditions have not improved. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> The smooth power that Jones has experienced is due to a totally uncompetitive turbo setting of 2.5 bar, about half race boost. But at least everything else is stable. 
78 uh, pounds per square inch on the oil, yeah. and uh, about 86, 87 on the uh, temperature. Um, but no, nothing, not enough. Nothing. Use ton five, I think. Yeah. Oh, thanks, Charlie. And you clean all the way up? Yeah, though. clean, no problems. Very clean on the down run and no hesitating or popping or just any, any of that nonsense going on. And the initial... Sort that out, yeah, <laughs> you, you'll, you'll start to improve it now. Yeah, I'm not <laughs> very, I'm very, I think it's a pro because I was already up. Jim Coates is not happy with the plenum charge temperature or PCT sensor from the computer and decides to change to the left-hand bank of cylinders. The two ground should be T and U. And U. Let's try U then. There it is. That's that ground. So what should be the uh, PCT for that one? OK, that's L. That's PCT, so what, where's right. the signal? So we should pick it up on N. So N, so if we go into that one. So the other one is there, isn't it? Yeah. But the real problem is that the engine was never designed to run under Arctic conditions. Depends when they're running, really, because it wouldn't take us half an hour to do it. Are we going to have this engine back? I wouldn't have thought so after today. I thought it was. Do you want to get some radar? Well, I want to get some miles on it. Because at the moment, I mean, they've got no references on this circuit, how quick no. they go in and what it feels like or anything. It just says it's long, it's bumpy. You know, it runs. Mm -hmm. Now it's Tombe's turn. He will put in half a dozen trouble-free laps and confirm Jones's view that the engine is smooth, but well down on power. Three laps, I think. Mm -hmm. No stop. That's what he said, and then lunch. For the moment, his main concern is the rather uncomfortable crutch strap on the ill-fitting harness. Oh! Oh. You think you need to get the, the crutch uh, strap uh, from so far back? Since the first icy test at Borum, the team have given the car an inconclusive run at Snetterton. Now, aerodynamicist Ross Braun is back in the Cranfield Aeronautics wind tunnel. All Formula One aerodynamicists are locked in an endless quest for more downforce. <laughs> Downforce is aerodynamic pressure on the car. It produces extra grip. Before sliding skirts were banned in 1980, this grip was achieved with undercar suction or ground effect. There still is a type of uh, performance from under the car, but nothing like as good as the ground effect cars used to be. But we, we're now back into the area of the same overall downforce of the car. Um, that we had with the ground effect cars, but it's much more draggy, it's much less efficient. So we've lost efficiency, which has been compensated for with the performance of the engines. So um, the cars are really probably back in, well, they're, they're faster than the ground effect cars again. In terms of overall downforce, the rear wing probably contributes 50 to 60 percent of the forces involved, whereas in ground effect days it was a much smaller percentage. Now the cleaner and higher quality that flows the rear wing we can get, the more performance we get out of it. With this new engine, it's very low, very compact, so the engine is no longer the limiting factor to how uh, clean we can make the flow to the rear wing. the 4th, 1986. Britain is still in the grip of a miserable winter. This is the Castle Donington circuit. The 
other Formula One teams bake in the Rio sunshine in preparation for the first Grand Prix of the season. Cosworth have produced an engine with full race boost and the vicious power induces wheel spin on the wet surface. It is mid-afternoon, but all day things have not gone well. The loop's not open, obviously. The day started with bad news from Rio. Progress made by the other teams in electronics had been seen first-hand by Tombe. I said so that the electronics presented by Honda and by BMW makes them look like uh, they're just uh, beginners, uh, just unreal type of uh, software and hardware that they can come up with. It's clear the electronics advantage that Ford had hoped to achieve before racing the car has been eroded. But the engine management module is now working well, and it's simply a lack of circuit testing that's holding up the development of the software strategy. The team trailer is a mobile workshop. Inside, Steve Taylor and Chief Development Engineer Martin Walters pass the latest strategy or map from the main computer to the electronically programmable memory, or EEPROM. Hold on. About three minutes. This is known as burning a chip. Each chip can produce quite different behavior from the same engine. Well, obviously, the mapping data is different. It's, uh, this has got the most latest specification in the, uh, in the chip for the, uh, for the engine calibration. <laughs> Okay. Right. It is ten past ten, and with rain forecast, there's no time to lose. The EEPROM carrier is clipped into the module. Before the team can allow the car out, they must check the engine kill switch on the steering wheel. This is a safety device to stop the engine if the throttle jams. It fails to work. Immediately, the team assume that it's a fault of the program in the engine management computer. Yeah, I know, precisely. I know the thing, which is still bad. Thing. I mean, we don't want to do that. We don't want to do that, so we ought to sort it. Yeah. Paul has got, I think, the, the program that was run at Snipton. Yes. We can't run the car like that because it hasn't got the fill map in for the for high cost. Yes, okay. But at least we can see if the kill switch works on that. Yes, okay. Because presumably it did work, isn't it? It did work. Yeah, no, it worked. worked. I mean, yeah, no one said it didn't. Well, it worked so. at the shop because, I mean, we tried, we checked. Yeah. Did it work at the shop yesterday then? Harry, did that work yesterday at the shop? But does anybody really know? It did or it didn't? That worked yesterday. Yeah. I think the first thing is what Paul's doing is to put that one in, which is the one that was run at Snetterton. Yeah. Okay. See if that works. If that doesn't work, then we have to have a look at the wiring. There's only three wires from, from that pipe to there and back, so there's very little that can go wrong. They decide to change the module. But Steve Taylor is convinced that the program is correct and starts the painstaking search for a fault in the car's wiring.
because the engine is set for race boost, they cannot use the module from the slow run at Snetterton. The only engine management module available is this one from the previous dynamometer test. But because there's no need for a kill switch on the dynamometer, no one knows whether this module is correctly wired or not. No, it's oh, alright, we just want to try it. We just, oh, yeah. We're not even going to bother. Hang on, there's one of these full of yeah. And he says there's an old patch of ice up against the pit wall on this side, but oh, yeah? it just go very slowly. still doesn't work, and team manager Tyler Alexander turns his attention to the switch itself. Yes, I don't want to do that unless yeah, you can reach that, but can you? Not very well. Not very well, but you can reach it, yes, okay. The rain, forecast for midday, arrives half an hour early and brings with it Team Lotus, hoping to test their latest Renault engine. Taylor has decided to put the module back the way it was. The activity attracts Renault engineers from the Lotus team. Okay, we'll just check to see if it runs and then we'll go. Unaware of the increasingly desperate kill switch problem, the Renault engineers try to catch a glimpse of the new Ford engine. Shortly after midday, the fault is finally traced to a wiring change in the car. As cold fingers fumble with the catches, everyone knows it's going to be a cold, wet afternoon. fumes at the Dino Ferrari circuit in Italy. It is the end of untimed practice at the San Marino Grand Prix. Now the teams prepare their cars for timed practice to qualify for a position on the starting grid. 
During the morning, they have run in race trim, but to qualify, the cars are changed in subtle ways. This is the waste gate. It's a spring-loaded valve which controls the boost from this, the turbocharger compressor. For qualifying, the boost must be increased, so waste gates with stronger springs will be fitted. It is the first race for the new car. The engine management computer is now half its original size and finally mounted in its correct position on top of the fuel tank. Take a look at all of our sensors here and make sure that everything is working properly. For the race, the computer must run the engine as economically as possible, conserving every drop of its 195 litres of fuel. To qualify, a turn of the screwdriver reprograms the engine into a fire-breathing gas guzzler. As timed practice starts, favourites for pole position are the Honda powered Williams. World champion Prost in the Porsche powered McLaren. Both the Williams cars look for a clear run, followed by the Renault-powered Ligier. With a flying lap of 1 minute 25.8 seconds, Nelson Piquet's Honda Williams lays claim to pole position. But his main rival, Ayrton Senna, in the Renault-powered Lotus, goes ahead by less than half a second, almost immediately. Piquet just nine laps and his first set of sticky qualifying tyres are finished. Each team is allowed two sets of qualifying tyres and to prevent cheating, an official marks them with a code. Qualifiers are made from a special compound that goes sticky when it gets hot. If we can get them nice and warm, we can sort of go out and get into it on the first lap, or certainly at the end of the first lap. Yeah, and then if, if, if you get it in the first lap, what you do is you get a second one out of it. No, that's it. That's it, because it's a quite a long lap there, and they're gone. So you really, I mean, in terms of qualifying laps, you get two qualifying laps. Put it away. Which is a bit crazy. The car is ready for its debut. Formula One includes a set of dimensions to which every car must conform. But before it can be measured, the flat spots must be rolled out of the tyres. Tombe will not drive the new car in this race. His is still being finished back at the Heathrow factory. While other teams grapple for a position on the grid, Japanese technicians in the Williams pit quietly prepare extra engines in case the others explode. These Honda V6s are said to produce up to 1,200 horsepower for qualifying. But today, all eyes are on this new act as it enters the Formula One arena for the first time.
The diminutive V6 can now run in anger. Its onboard computer holding left and right hand banks of cylinders in fiery equilibrium. Jones, feeling grip in his tires, tries for a quick lap. Qualifying tyres on the rear of the car tend to warm up quicker than the front, so the team have developed a system for preheating the front tyres before leaving the pits. But technologists from Goodyear are concerned about the effect this might have on the compound. I want to try and get back out if I can and have another go. The reason I went for it on the first lap is because the front tyres actually felt quite good. They were hanging in there. So it's pointless doing another lap, that's where I went for it. Is he happy with the pickup now? Is he happy with it? <laughs> is he never happy with it? Probably never. <laughs> we'll ask him this. Another set of tyres are being gently cooked. How are those tyres doing? They should be another couple do, of minutes. Could do another four minutes. Yeah. As the qualifying hour ticks away, a problem is discovered. The left hand rear brake caliper is rubbing on the wheel rim. blankets, the front tyres are readied for another quick lap. Despite pleas from Jones for an extra powerful qualifying engine, Cosworth have refused to build one, believing instead that a track record of reliability will pay off in the long run. Jones cannot better his first attempt, and as other teams improve their performance, slips to 21 on the grid. The smoke pouring from these cars during qualifying is evidence of the massive amount of fuel being burned in the search for extra speed. With special tires, excessive boost, even special engines, qualifying has become a farce, with little relevance to the race itself, where economy and tire durability are needed to win. Despite being egged on by their hometown Tifosi, even Ferrari seem wearied by the irrelevance of it all.
the new team begin to get into the swing of it. Little more fuel is added as Mike Cranifus gives Jones his latest lap time of 1 minute 30.8 seconds. Despite his lack of horsepower, Jones, determined to have another go, decides to cobble together a set of tyres from his used qualifiers in the hope of knocking a few tenths of a second off his lap time. What are they doing? Just trying to make a decent sort of tyres out of the two that I've used. Okay, no. <laughs> Yeah, just, I mean, two, two tenths and you're eights or nines. Yeah, or no. it's, it's, it's very close to it. At the other end of the pit lane, Nelson Piquet has used up his qualifiers and watches his Williams teammate Nigel Mansell try to push Lotus off pole position. <laughs> Jones decides to put race tyres on the rear of the car and qualifiers on the front. But Cosworth's Paul Ray spots a problem. The exhaust has cracked just ahead of the turbocharger. Today's game is over. Jones will drive 29 competitive laps in tomorrow's race before retiring with a damaged radiator. But for today, unnoticed by the assembled press, Jim Coates secretly files the first day's work into the computer. Mysterious fuel systems problem or something which can give him the right performance. 15th number 18, Thierry Bootson with the Barclay USF and G Arrows BMW. 16th number 24, Alessandro Nanini with the Minardi Motori Moderni. 17th number 15, Alan Jones making first public appearance for the new Haas Lola Ford THL2 with the new six-cylinder Ford Turbo with a full team from the electronic engineering division of Ford here with it as well as the Cosworth people running conservative boosted qualifying but running very reliably two cars alternating all day.